The material in this podcast is for information purposes only. It does not represent the opinions of Vested Finance and is not intended to be investment advice. We recommend you to consult with a financial advisor before committing to any financial decisions. Hi everyone, welcome to episode ten of our Vested Finance podcast. My name is Kai Han. I'm an editor at Vested, calling in from Singapore. My co-host today is Darwin, a co-founder at Vested, who is recording from the U.S. Great to have you here today, Darwin. Thanks, Kai. Glad to be here again. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us again this week. All right, Kai. I think we're going to be talking about the vaccine today, right? Yeah, and honestly, I can't wait for the vaccine to become available. I don't think I quite grasp the concept of COVID fatigue until now. To our listeners, I'm normally based in China, but since February, I've been stuck in Singapore. And being home isn't a bad thing, but being stuck in the house for more than a month under national lockdown, plus the fact that I can't even travel overseas, that is simply frustrating. Yeah, I'm starting to lose track of time myself too. Let's start things off by talking about Pfizer. They recently announced that their vaccine reached ninety percent effectiveness in their ongoing trial. Okay, so a disclaimer: I'm not a doctor, nor am I an epidemiologist. The information we discuss here is based on publicly available information. Generally, when you're testing a vaccine, you don't know the percent of efficacy ahead of time. You only know after you undergo the trial with a significant enough group of people. Right now, the Pfizer vaccine announcement that they did is in phase three. More than forty thousand people, but half is in the placebo group. The other half is in the vaccine group, and then they measure the total number of people who still got COVID within this group. And the latest number that they announced last week, Monday, was ninety-four. The trial is still ongoing. They're looking to get about one hundred sixty-four folks who from this group got COVID to get greater statistical certainty. Just to give our listeners some background on vaccines, can you talk about what a vaccine is and the two types of approaches to making one? Okay, in layman terms, vaccines work by teaching your immune system to recognize and attack pathogens or disease. Could be virus, could be bacteria, and help to train your immune system to cope with this disease without actually getting the disease. So there are two approaches to making vaccines. The first is the traditional approach where you use a dead or weakened. That they call attenuated pathogens that can train your immune system without you getting sick. So these vaccines are typically grown in a biological system. Most commonly in eggs are now also cell based. For example, the most common one is the flu vaccine. In the U.S., you get one every year around fall time. And then there's this new approach to use RNA and DNA materials. These are genetic materials that constitute only a portion of the genetic code of the pathogen. Rather than administer the whole structure of the pathogen, bacteria, or viruses, this method injects you only with the genetic code that allows your body to identify and kill the pathogen. Because it uses a lot less biological materials, it can be produced faster. So Pfizer's vaccine is a type of the second approach. It's actually an mRNA vaccine that trains the body immune system to recognize the coronavirus signature, targeting the spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus. Moderna's vaccine also uses this approach. It's likely that Moderna will announce similar results. It's amazing because the global pandemic has accelerated the development of this mRNA approach by decades. This is the fastest vaccine development. Typically, vaccine before this, the fastest vaccine development from initial clinical trial, phase one, two, three, and then distribution is about five years. We're doing this now in less than one year, and on top of that, we're doing that on a completely new platform, the mRNA platform. Well, I'm happy to know that we're so close to a vaccine candidate. I mean, the sooner the better, I guess, since in the U.S., daily new cases have already breached 184,000, while globally the confirmed case count is at a staggering 54 million. It makes people wonder how much longer before the pandemic ends. This announcement is great, but there's still a long path ahead of us. Before giving an emergency FDA licensing approval at the end of the phase three, there's another two or so months of safety observation. Before the license is approved, but back to your original question: When or how will the pandemic end? The pandemic will end if we can reduce the rate of which the disease spreads. The technical term for this factor is called the R naught. So, if we get the R naught to be less than one, that means every new infected person infects less than one other person. That way, the disease will just die out. Now, to achieve this, you have to achieve what the scientists call herd immunity. Generally, you have two types of people, right? Two populations in regards to COVID-19 vulnerability: people who have immunity and people who do not. 
Herd immunity happens when a large enough segment of the population becomes immune to COVID, to any disease really, making the probability for the non-immune to get the disease low enough that the transmission of the disease, COVID in this case, from person to person is extremely unlikely. So the end result is the protection of the whole population for both the immune and the non-immune. There are two ways you can achieve herd immunity. The first is achieving herd immunity naturally by having enough people get sick and develop antibodies. This approach has not worked so well. Case in point is Sweden. Sweden is actually a country that did not initiate a lockdown. It experienced not only a very high rate of death, but also suffered equally severe economic downturn despite lack of a lockdown. Especially when you compare it to the surrounding Scandinavian countries that imposed more stringent lockdown protocols. Turns out, even if the government tells you not to congregate, not to go shop or eat in a restaurant, when there's a pandemic, people stop doing that anyway. So the economic impact was still felt. Number two is via vaccination. You can achieve herd immunity via vaccination by having enough people get vaccinated so that the remainder of the population that cannot or will not get vaccination is protected. Is the key to ending the pandemic to vaccinate the entire world? How do we get 7 billion people vaccinated? Hopefully, we don't need to get the entire world population vaccinated, just the majority of them. But it is still an extremely challenging endeavor, though. There are a couple of challenges here. So first, it takes time to immunize the individual. Right now, Pfizer's vaccine requires two doses to be administered three weeks apart, and only about 28 days after the first dose, where you see significant antibodies. In other words, from the moment you get vaccinated, the first dose until you're quote unquote immune, it may take a month. Number two, there are significant logistical challenges to distribute, store this type of vaccine, specifically the Pfizer's vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. It needs to be stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius. This is very stringent temperature requirement. This means to distribute the vaccine, you have to maintain an uninterrupted cold chain distribution system at this temperature. Under ideal conditions, this is challenging. Even in developed countries, this would be nigh impossible in emerging countries where the infrastructure is not as developed. There's actually a recent study by DHL and McKinsey looking at the global infrastructure readiness for cold chain storage for different stringent temperature requirements. Their studies expect that about two thirds of the world's population will not be able to support the distribution of a vaccine if the temperature requirement is this stringent, negative 80 degrees Celsius. Even in the U.S., this would pose significant logistical challenges. To maintain a negative 80 degrees Celsius, you actually require special refrigeration equipment, which many hospitals and clinics in the U.S. do not have. And then storage and shipping will require the use of dry ice, frozen CO2, frozen carbon dioxide, which is in short supply due to the decline in ethanol production. Most carbon dioxide is a byproduct of ethanol production. And finally, at the final distribution location, the vaccine does not have long shelf life. Pfizer's latest guideline says that their vaccine can be stored up to five days in normal refrigerator. Will all the vaccines require the same stringent storage requirements? It depends on the platform of the vaccine. When I say platform, it's the approach the vaccine is made of. It could be an mRNA base. It could be adenovirus or other methods. They could also add stabilizing agents to make the vaccine more stable and have longer storage life. That said, there are other vaccines in development that may not require as stringent refrigeration. Moderna's vaccine, although it's built on the same mRNA platform, is expected to only require negative 20 degrees Celsius. While vaccines developed by AstraZeneca and Oxford University must be kept cool but not frozen. At the moment, there are about 53 vaccines undergoing clinical trials on humans, and at least 12 are in large phase three testing. Pfizer is the first to announce results, and we're still waiting on the others. China and Russia are also doing large-scale phase three testing. Now, the downside is that you may have to wait longer for access to these vaccines since they are a bit earlier in the development. It sounds like we have to develop the logistical capabilities to distribute these vaccines, which obviously will require massive investments. But what about the production capabilities? So Pfizer had mentioned that it will produce enough doses to immunize about 15 to 20 million people by the end of this year. It's likely that the people that will get the vaccine first are folks with high risk of exposure, either medical or essential workers, and vulnerable populations, the elderly. But beyond that, I think we are still unsure of how the vaccines will be distributed. Most countries have secured deals with different drug manufacturers to guarantee supply. 
to vaccinate 7 billion people, we may need 14 billion doses, assuming it takes two doses to complete the regimen. And it may take years for the manufacturing to ramp up to achieve this scale. Pfizer did say by the end of 2021, they expect to have the capacity to manufacture about 1.3 billion doses, so to vaccinate 650 million people. Although that supply mostly have been secured by the US, UK, Europe, and Japan. About 80% of the supply have been secured by these developed countries. What about the supply for developing countries? Here, India will play a very key role. One of the largest vaccine manufacturers, the Serum Institute, has partnerships with AstraZeneca and all the other vaccine publishers to manufacture not for only India, but other developing countries. The challenge remains, though, if the temperature requirement is that cold, it will be tough to distribute. So back to the original question, how do we achieve herd immunity? How many people do we need to vaccinate? We can estimate the required vaccination level if we know the following two factors. First, we need to know the efficacy rate of the vaccine. Initially, before the Pfizer's announcement, scientists were expecting 50 to 60 percent efficacy rate because that is the average flu vaccine's efficacy rate. But it was a very pleasant surprise that Pfizer's announcement said that their vaccine effectiveness is at 90 percent. But there's a good chance that that number will go down a little bit as more people receive the vaccine. The second factor is the duration of the protection. Right now, we don't know how long the vaccine will protect the individual from infection. Studies are still ongoing, but there are evidence, although rare, that COVID-19 reinfection is possible. There's a handful of recorded cases where previously sick people got the disease the second time, months after the first incident. So what this means from a vaccine development standpoint is unclear. There's a possibility that the population will require periodic re-immunization, similar to the flu vaccine. In the U.S., people are encouraged to take the flu vaccine every year since the virus changes rapidly. Now, if we assume effectiveness rate of 80% for the vaccine, then we can back calculate what is the coverage rate required to get that R0 number to be less than one. And it turns out that you have to vaccinate anywhere between 80 to 100% of the population. So about 90% of the population to achieve herd immunity, at least for the first few years, assuming that the immunity lasts one year. This is an unprecedented level of vaccination coverage. We have never attempted this level of vaccination in the U.S., let alone globally. Just to give you a comparison, in the U.S., the land of the free, where it's difficult even to mandate mask wearing, right? The annual flu vaccination rate is about 48% for adults, about half. So we need to double that percentage to achieve COVID-19 herd immunity. That's not a comforting number. Nevertheless, when the Pfizer news broke, markets shifted. Shares of companies in sectors that struggled initially have jumped, while shares of companies within the tech sector, which gained during the pandemic, went down. Yeah, the market reacted now that it has a clear path towards a return to normalcy. The shift might be premature, though. As we've discussed, having a vaccine that works is one thing, but the world still faces significant challenges in order to produce and distribute the vaccine at a global level. In all likelihood, it will take a better part of 2021 and maybe 2022 to get the majority of the population vaccinated to significantly slow down the spread. In the meantime, we have to employ all the tools in our toolbox. We have to maintain social distancing, minimize indoor gatherings, still wear masks. So a lot of the economy might still be hampered. And while we wait for the vaccine, as of the recording of this podcast, daily cases in the U.S. have surpassed 180,000, with regulators now considering a second wave of lockdowns. What a session. In a sense, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic, but yet on the other hand, we have a long way to go. Yeah, I'm optimistic as well. Again, it's a really great news. Record time in vaccine development, record effectiveness rate, but we still have a long way to go. So cautiously optimistic is the right term. As always, Kai, great chatting. To our listeners, we hope that you have enjoyed listening to this episode. For more insights into markets and emerging technologies, please visit our blog at vested.co.in. As always, take care and stay safe.